Well, Deborah, uh, congratulations, and uh, thank you for having uh, Gallup be a part of this uh, important 30th anniversary, and, and congratulations uh, on the great contribution that you've made, not only to business and industry, but also to our, to, to our country. So we were asked to make a report. That might work, doesn't it? Make a report to talk a little bit about productivity, and more specifically about, about growth. And uh, we're going to hand the report out in just a minute. I don't want to go through the report because you can read it yourself. As a matter of fact, I have a slide deck with one slide. I don't think I, I've never done a slide presentation before, but I got one slide, so I do refer to it as my deck. Um, but I, I wanted to take a little bit of a different angle on it, kind of a leadership angle on, on what we've done. The guy that founded our company was a guy named Dr. George Gallup, who was an academic more than he was a, um, I'm going to say, entrepreneur. But he had, and he usually makes that list of 100 uh, most influential, the real good list, not the Time Magazine list that has chefs and all that kind of stuff, but the one with George Washington and Franklin and that kind of thing. But he had a, a thing where he, he loved democracy so much. He said, if democracy is about the will of the people, somebody should go find out what that will is. Then he would always report that to Washington, not unlike what, what Deborah and the council, and to make a clarion call. Because what he said was, if you're wrong, and this is what he worried about, if you're wrong about the will of the people, when you make policies and you lead, and you're wrong about that premise, the more you lead, the worse you make things. But what a wonderful what, what a wonderful mission. But I was thinking about how that applied to right, to right now and about, and about growth. Because let me just ask you, are we in a recovery? Because it's a debate. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I should say this in front of this group, but I, I didn't actually know what productivity was. I know what GDP is. And I have some opinions about that. I know that 2.5% is a lot better than where we are now at about 1.5 or 1.7. I know that we need 2.5% to break even with the amount of costs we have. And when you're at 1.7, you're slowly going broke. I also looked into, did you know that between 18, if you said, what's the right amount of GDP to have? I, th I don't think this bores a group like, like this, but I don't know what the right number is. Can you go up to 8? Can you have 9%? Would there be something where you, what do we need? The biggest moment in the history of human development over the last couple thousand years was between 1850 and 1950 in the United States of America. We just kind of overwhelmed the world, and now we're 25% of all the, all the money. Here's a good question. What was GDP during that time series? You know what the answer is? Three and three quarters. But think how small those differences are. So three and three quarters, if you said, how do we boom and dominate the world again economically? The answer is three and three quarters over a time series of, I don't know, 10 years or something like that. How do you go broke? You have a time series of about like we do now, 1.5 or 1.7. But you have to be somewhere about above 2.5% or in try to know that. But the next thing I learned was that GDP is not the best method. And if you take a population of economists, both right-leaning, moderate, left-leaning, whatever it is, they say that the best measure is actually GDP per capita. I didn't know that. I started thinking, well, maybe it'd be GDP per worker would be good. Well, you can't do that because that, you know, some, you have fewer people in the workforce, and so if you get too many drop out, then you have it inflated. You have to do GDP for the whole population because um, people at home, good for them, there's a lot of people that should be at home, but, but they use the economy too. So do babies. So the best number you can use, and so that's the number that Gallup and the council and then my team of economists uh, chose, to, chose to use. And we went back 50 years. And we determined that that was the single best metric to determine if we're in a recovery. But now remember, if we're in a recovery, I looked the word up. I was on a flight back from Frankfurt, Deborah, I was thinking about this. 
And you know the way they bring you all the newspapers. I had the Financial Times, I had the Wall Street Journal, the International New York Times. I found an article in every single paper on the front page that referred to America's recovery. That seems like a very important article to me. So I looked up recovery. It, it, it means that you've been sick and you're getting better. You're recovering. That's what it means. You, would, you wouldn't think I'd have to look that up, but I did. But going back to Dr. Gallup's point, if we are in a recovery, that suggests totally different activities than if we are not in a recovery. If we're in a recovery, it, it suggests everything's going well, and to kind of get your hands off the wheel and tweak it a little bit and keep nudging it in that right direction. If we're in decline, that means that you got to shake everything up. That means you need to turn around. You need to turn around. You see what the difference? But, but it harkens back to you. You better get your premises right. Because if we're wrong about that one, the more we lead, the more we ruin the country. So here's my deck, my one slide deck. This is 50 years of GDP per capita in the United States. Can you look at that and see your recovery? I wrote down three quotes that I just fit. You can find them anywhere you want. This one's from the Wall Street Journal. The guy's name is Eric. I, don't, I won't say the rest of his name, but I've read him before. Here's what he said. The US economy appears to be growing at its fastest pace in two years. I don't know what he sees, but I guess you can say it. I think you can go through like the radio salesman. You probably can find one little blip somewhere, maybe between one quarter and another. I, I don't know. Here's one from, uh, I won't say his name, but from Raymond Jones, the investment banking company in New York. <clears throat> Growth is a lot stronger than it looks. I don't know what that means. But where do you find growth is stronger than it looks on there? This one's interesting, OK? This, this, is my last, this is my last one. Have you ever heard of confirmation bias? A guy got a Nobel Prize for this. But when you make a decision and you come to a conclusion, what he figured out was only 30% is based on fact and 70% is based on emotion. He's actually a psychologist, the only psychologist to get a Nobel Prize in economics, Danny Kahneman, about, I don't know, about six or seven years ago. But confirmation bias is that you only look, you look for facts that confirm what you want to believe. But you wonder how often we get into that, whether it's, uh, Mario, you and I were talking about that you, you, most of the media tried to find facts. I'm not picking on the media. All of us did it. I did it too. But why only Hillary can win? Why Brexit will never work? Why the electorate in Colombia will never vote for a FARC treaty? Nobody saw Arab Spring coming because we keep that 70% dominates all of our thinking and dominates our thinking. We're always in a fight with that 70%. This one is really an important one. This one was, we are seeing definite evidence. I don't know if my senior uh, um, editor is here in the room, but I don't think there is anything called definite evidence. You either have evidence or you don't have evidence. But anyway, we are seeing definite evidence, like convince me it's, this is the time I really mean it, it's evidence. The economy is expanding more strongly. Definite evidence. Who do you think said that one? You, do you know? Some of you look like, that's Janet Yellen. So she's, got, she's, she's working on my 70% too. We're not in a recovery. It, simple, I, I'm a, it helps me when I can reduce things to kind of their simplest form. But if we were a company and this was a shareholders meeting, I'd be reporting to you that our sales are 18 trillion. We have 100 million full-time employees. We have 50 million part-time employees, and we have debt of 20 trillion. 
going to 30 trillion, and we have revenue that's increasing at a decreasing rate, and our revenue is down to about 1.7, and I can draw finish the line to where it's zero. Do you want some of that stock? The next thing I'd tell you is that I got some good news for you. And that is that food's cheaper, Sam, than it's ever been before. So when I was a kid, it's, it's, it was almost twice as much. That's some good news, transportation and gas. But we have three expenses that are totally out of control. 18 trillion of sales, 20 trillion of debt. But we got three line items that are booming out of control. You know what they are? We need to know. Education. We all know health care. We all know housing. And I see in the clarion call there that I think we know those pretty well. Remember, there's some real basics that you need to know as shareholders, too. One of them is that, you know, with health care, we spend twice what other comparable countries spend on health care per person. We spend twice as much as England, Canada, France, Germany, two times as much. Next thing you need to know is that they all live longer than we do. You don't like to hear that. That doesn't work well under the confirmation bias. That one doesn't fit neatly in there. The great American health care system. It makes you wonder a little bit. So Canadians live three years longer than us. French live three years longer than us. We spend twice as much. It makes, you, makes, you, makes me wonder if the more they spend on us, the faster they kill us. <laughs> you read this, I mean, you can hardly believe it. You've got to Google it to believe it. I did it, but I was wondering how many people are killed in hospitals. You know, we worry about soldiers. I know there's a general, and I know the admirals here. I don't know, I think this single digits in war over the last 10 years. You read the New England uh, Journal of Medicine, how many people were killed in hospitals last year? Put a number in your mind. Their answer, Google it, their answer is 100,000. It's dangerous to be in Baghdad, Afghanistan. You want to go to places where you're really in danger? Go to health, go, get into a hospital. They maimed a million. I'm just saying. The um, Johns Hopkins, they put their number out, and they said 250,000. But you wonder when you have an expense item that's that out of control and has that little success, do you really need do you really need uh, Kaizen? Do you need Six Sigma? Do you need Lean, or do you need total dis or do you need total disruption? Another one that our analysts found was education. I don't need to go on and on about that, but you know it's booming. It has also many other implications um, to the amount of debt that boomers have. You know, boomers are going to be wonderful workers. They are really different. I saw a conversation on Squawk Box this morning, and they were talking about are um, millennials different than any other generations? They all, uh, they said, no, they're no different at all. They're just younger. They came to a conclusion. That, but that fits, again, there's your confirmation bias. It fits the line that they needed. I'm just going to tell you a few, and you tell me if this makes them different. One thing is they don't have babies. That seems to make them quite a bit different. You know, this is the first year where, where the white man is uh, going to be smaller. They're causing the white man to be extinct. That seems like a real big one to me. They also have the lowest marriage rate since the history of our company. When I was a kid, the great American dream was to own a house. Not so much with them. Home ownership's the lowest it's ever been. We've just been wrong about that uh, American dream. But it changes almost everything. They don't buy diapers anymore. They all have pets, so they buy expensive dog food. I'm not making a joke. If any of you have stock in pet food, it's just it's shooting. It's going absolutely through the roof. The changes are extraordinary, but yet we're wrong about them. You know, I, I even it's, it kind of bothered me. I was, I was watching Squawk Box. I said I thought this morning. I thought I wonder if everybody goes away with that confirmation bias and they go out and they all do their jobs wrong because they concluded the wrong thing there, because they did. So I looked up their ratings. This morning, they have 100,000 people watching. I don't know if that's a big number or a small number, but I know it's about the same of a Michigan home game. Uh, so it'd be about a crowd about that big. Bingo. Here, I can tell the. <clears throat> but they're very important people. That's the point. 
So I don't care if there's a million or not, but they're very important people. So then they all go out. They've got the wrong thing. They're going to manage wrong. But there's one real important thing in there that has to do with education. Baby boomers are going to be very good workers. Here's one big difference between my generation and the generation before. Generation before, of course, baby boomers produced jillions of babies. The other thing they did is started a whole bunch of new companies. The other thing that millennials don't do, besides not having babies, is they also don't start companies. So when you, and, and that needs to be fixed somehow. But education's probably not doing that because what we've done is when we ask them where they are right now, they're in a whole different state of mind than my group because what? Saddled with debt. The other thing is when you ask them about, do you think there's going to be money? If you ask me, do you think there's going to be money for your retirement, whatever, I say, yeah. How about for your kids? I think there'll be some for my kids. How about for your grandkids? I know there won't be. But now those kids will become aware of that. So if you take education, if you take housing, if you take health care, it may not be as simple. They're, it's more complicated in how they fit into all the decisions that we make, the clarion call that we make, because all of them seem to be tied somehow to, to, to growth. I'm trying to... I've been trying to stretch my thinking, Deborah, since we started this project, because I keep getting surprised so much. But if you said, what did you figure out? And, and the report, I think, will be, maybe it's coming out now. I'm, I, I, that's why I'm not doing the report. You can, you can read yourself. I'm trying to make some reckless remarks here. <clears throat> but so we, we know that we need more growth. And I can say this to this group, because my, my business is selling innovation. But when we say, how do you fix our GDP and this problem? We know we need to get the pie growing. So you say, what are you going to do to get the pie growing? And you know what our answer is? We've all concluded the same thing. We did it with our own confirmation bias, and we're wrong. We think it's just innovation. So we just keep building up innovation. We spend hundreds of billions of dollars on innovation. You read the Wall Street Journal, it was either yesterday or the day before. And we have a record number of, of patents. I mean, the, since 2000, it's just boomed. I mean, invent, uh, innovation is, we're, we're blowing it through the roof. <clears throat> so how are we doing with new companies? It's the lowest it's ever been. So we just keep booming because somebody told us innovation creates companies. And we don't consider it. We, we don't consider the other side of it. Maybe it doesn't. Of course, it's a big part of it. But I'll just throw this out to you. What if innovation has no value whatsoever unless it's in the presence of a customer? We don't think of that. What about innovation has no value at all until it has a business model that works? It's a story that's kind of unbelievable, but you all know who Vince Cerf is? What a great guy. He and Bob Kahn got the packets to fly through fiber optics, and that became the internet. They were the, the, the Wright brothers or something. He told me this story at dinner. It's got to be true, because it's not complimentary to Vint, and he's I mean, one of the most important Americans ever. But he was doing his job. Remember, he'd already built that thing at DARPA, so that we, you know, we could send signals around and all that. And a guy came over from the US Senate who loved technology and said to him, let me see that thing. Vince showed it to him, and he went, oh my god, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Can I go back to the Senate and pass a bill and throw it out to commerce and see what they can do with it? What a conversation. You know what Vince said back to him? Fine with me, but I don't see what value it'll have to business. That's a lot bigger conversation than Watson, come here, I need you, or whatever. But, but you know who the senator was? Huh? Yeah, it was Al. I'm the only guy in the world that tells a nice story about Al Gore, I think. <laughs> but, but think if Al Gore hadn't come over there. Maybe he knew that. Maybe he knew that that innovation had no value at all. What, what, what about another $100 billion for, the, for that DARPA piece? But see, until you have customers, boom, we got an explosion out of it. But maybe when we build institutions of innovation, somebody better raise their hand and say, it's not, it's not making the pie any bigger. It's not fixing that right there. What fixes it? is when somebody, actually, when somebody actually starts a business. There's been about six million, you'll read there's 26 million companies, there's actually only six million. Of the six million, four million of them have only uh, uh, 1.4 employees. There's only two million businesses. That's getting smaller. 
See, we keep working on innovation while the part that actually fires it and creates customers and creates GDP and GDP per capita, that's getting smaller. Yet we keep working on this one because that fits our confirmation bias. I think I'm going to end it with this point, but I think I can, I think this will make sense. Here's where you have hope. If you're an engineer, you look for solutions where you find variation. So these terrible numbers aren't consistent across the country. So you have some states that are doing, that are probably never turn themselves around. I don't know what you do with Illinois, I don't know what you do with California. I mean, they're, they're so underwater. <clears throat> but then you have other states that make a profit. You know, Florida's killing it. I was just out in Wyoming, and they're printing money out there. I don't know what's going on. But you see the variation? I get a kick out of um, Tennessee because that's a good one for researchers. Obviously, in the same country, so you got all the same laws. Same state, so you got the same governor, all the legislation and all that. But you got two cities in there with very different outcomes. One's Memphis and one's Nashville. Memphis is really struggling. Nashville's killing it. But what it does is it gives you hope. But leaders of these communities, especially by cities, I think even more by states, can change the outcome of America. And I, I noticed, Deborah, that, that somebody turned our story <clears throat> into Obama's failure or something like that. If you look at that line, you know a conclusion you could have that's, or that's way outside of confirmation bias? You could ask yourself, how much does the president really change the country? Because Obama's line is bad, so is Bush's. You go clear back to where there's really a big lift. Reagan had a big lift. Went down a little bit, of course, and you get the recession, then Clinton came back a little bit. I just throw this out to you. Because, you know, when we say things aren't going well, we say, well, we need a new president. That one's no good. Bush is no good. Let's try it. Well, that one didn't work either. Now let's, try, now let's go clear out and try this one. But I'm just wondering that, that there might be more solutions, you know, from the leadership of America, maybe 10,000 of us, maybe 100,000 of us than there is with the, with the president. But thank you again, Deborah, for all that you do. Congratulations on the 30 years, and thank you very much.